the show where anything goes. Motivation, mindset, recovery, philosophy, and life. We become who we are through what we experience. We all have a story. And this is My Backstory with Josh Boyer. What's up, everyone? Here we are on the My Backstory podcast. Episode number 19? Yeah, I think it's 19. 19 or 20. <laughs> I kind of like lose track. Um, I'm in Chesapeake, Virginia with uh, Jason Redman. I'm super excited to do this uh, this podcast because when I started this podcast, it was, you know, I wanted it to be about mindset and overcoming uh, adversity and overcoming obstacles and breaking through and becoming the best version that you could possibly be. And what better person to share their story about that very topic than Jason Redman himself. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Jason. I'm going to let him share his backstory with you. Uh, if you don't already know, you're going to know. And it's um, it's an, an amazing, amazing story. So uh, Jason, go ahead and take it away, brother. Josh, thanks, man. Uh, honored to be on. Uh, thanks for being down here visiting visiting with us. Sure. Um, great job with Ray Cares podcast you know ray being a teammate and friend and we went through buds and hell week together so uh so yeah i am honored um yeah my story man my story is a crazy story i'm uh, very blessed to still be here um you know i tell a lot of people i'm i'm living on a second chance i am um you know a young, i'm a young kid or i was a young kid like many um warriors young warriors that are out there a kid who grew up in the G.I. Joe era and, uh, you know, loved G.I. Joe. And I grew up in a military family. My dad was Army and um, he served during Vietnam, although he did not go over to Vietnam. He was more of a training instructor here in the States. But he, you know, love of country. And I grew up hearing stories about my grandfather, who was a very decorated uh, pilot in World War II and then died um, after the war. And then my my grandfather on my mother's side who um, fought overseas during World War II, my great uncle was killed. So these were the stories I grew up with. So I was kind of enamored with the military, like many young young men out there. You know, you get enamored with the romantic side of the military the uniforms and the culture and the mindset and from a young age that's what i wanted to do and uh you know kind of bounced around different ideas from a young age i wanted to be a pilot like my grandfather and you know wanted to be in the air force i wanted to fly an f-15 i wanted to be part of the thunderbirds right. flying f-16 and then um as i got a little bit older and uh you know, a little more enamored with the whole GI Joe thing and started finding out about special operations and said, man, that's what I'd really like to do. Um, Army Rangers and the Green Berets. And, and my dad was the one that told me about the SEAL teams. He said, Hey, there's a group of individuals that are out there. You know, they came through jump school with us. I interacted with them and he said, they're, they're a unique breed. Uh, he said, you should look into them. And I did, and this was in the um, late 80s uh, time frame, and there really was nothing out there then. I yeah. couldn't find hardly anything. I found some articles in Soldier of Fortune. Uh, a member of our church was a big special operations buff, and he shared some articles and stuff with me. And I was kind of amazed i was kind of hooked i was like wow you know these guys you know they say this training one the fact that you couldn't find out much about him and two they said you know it was the toughest training in the military and the attrition rate was so high and uh i don't know what it is about that that made me say that's what i want to do we picked you know, the hardest thing ever <laughs> yeah and i mean you know it wasn't like i was this kid that had been doing stuff like that my whole life i mean i you know i mean i'm not a big guy i'm and you know so back then you know i was tiny um you know at, at 14 years old um i was nothing so my dad must have scratched his head and said all right Sure. And, uh, but I, I said 14 on, I was like, I'm going to be a seal and, uh, ran down that road and, you know, 
a uh, lots of twists and turns uh ended up joining the navy when i was 17 while i was still in high school graduated high school uh joined the navy on september 11 1992 which is That's amazing crazy. Yeah, yeah when you look back um you know such a fortuitous day but uh started boot camp in the summer of 93 right as soon as i graduated from high school and back then there was no seal pipeline or anything they basically were like when you get to boot camp there's going to be a guy that's going to come around and he's going to say who wants to be a seal and you raise your hand and say that's what you want to do and you know i was dumb enough back then and i'm like all right that sounds like a good plan you know i'll do that you know not realizing that uh you know any myriad of things could have gone wrong that i would not have uh gotten into the program but um but sure enough you know during boot camp some guy came around and said who wants to be a seal and i raised my hand they took us and we went and did the test and um and um thankfully i i passed it there was a whole bunch of us that uh and i'd been training for it man i'd been training you know for the last several years to get ready for that test so i knew i was going to crush it and uh and i did and i got a i got a slot to buds so um went to seal training when i was just um 19 years old or i was still 18 19 um i think i had just turned 20 when i graduated or yeah. you know so uh checked into my first seal team and i mean I'm, I'm a 20 year old kid man i'm you know dumber than a box of rocks and you know and here I am, I made it through SEAL training and show up at my SEAL team. And, you know, the world was very different back then. That's something I try and talk to a lot of people about. We were a pre-war military back then. We were pre-9-11. So, you know, you go through SEAL training, special opera operations training, or any military training, and you think, all right, I'm ready to go kick ass, man. I'm, you know, and, and you get there and they're like, okay, man, well, here you go, new guy, you know, swab the deck, clean this office, go paint that stuff. And you're like, hey, man, I'm, I'm a SEAL, bro. Yeah. You know, I made it through training. And they're like, first off, you're not a SEAL yet because you just made it through training. And guess what? You see all these pipe hitters around there? Around here, they all made it through training too. So nobody gives a shit. Yeah. Go paint and clean these <laughs> platoon huts. <laughs> so I uh, was handed a good piece of humble pie, uh, although I didn't eat much of it, I'll tell you. I, I you know, making it through training uh, kind of started a little bit of a dangerous road for me. And I think oftentimes this happens a lot in young men who start to find high levels of success early i hear a lot in professional sports they have issues with these young kids that you know are just dynamite and they make it to this elite level very young and then they lose their way they get arrogant and they're you know they're just dummies right. and uh unfortunately i kind of went down that path as a as a young enlisted seal i continued to excel you know i was in platoons and i did really well um but I was kind of growing just a little more. Every success made me a little more arrogant. Yep. And um, you got through on your first uh, your first team or your first uh, class. You didn't get you didn't get medically rolled or anything on your first class. No, I did. Oh, you did. Yeah, I, I did. I actually I got medically rolled twice. Actually. Oh wow. So I got medically rolled uh, the first time for severe tendonitis in my feet. I was with uh, I started with uh, class two hundred. I mean, I mean, if we want to get into into that. I was actually supposed to be in class 197 and I wrecked my motorcycle only weeks uh, before going to training. I was leaving and I wrecked my motorcycle and broke uh, my shoulder. Right. So that rolled me back a few classes. So I check in with uh, class 200. I go all the way through hell week with 200 with Ray Care. Ray and I were um, in the same boat crew together. We both were in the, <laughs> we're Smurf both crew. short dudes. We were in the Smurf crew together. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So Ray and I rolled through there, and then I got rolled uh, in second phase. Uh, Ray kept going, and I got rolled back. And uh, and a funny story, and this is just how dumb I was and how, you know, there are some guys that really have their eyes set on the prize. They know where they want to go. They set their goals. And I had set my goals at a young age, but then I started getting a little enamored. And this has something to do, in my opinion, a little bit with the nine pre-9-11 military. We trained hard. And we also partied very hard. And the military uh, uh, um, 
it's a it's a culture of that and that has its pluses and its minuses the minuses is some guys get lost in that and that becomes their way of life and uh and it actually hinders them and and they get out of the military and they want to continue to live that lifestyle which most of the civilian world doesn't live that lifestyle um so anyways um so here i am i get rolled from tendonitis i go down to mexico to party and i end up breaking my arm uh while drinking and being stupid i mean true story I walk out of the bar and I'm so drunk because down there, you know, I'm a 19 year old kid, but down there you could drink when you were 18. Yep. So I walk out of the bar, I'm hammered. And, uh, there's a young, uh, some, some young kids that are doing flips off the boardwalk down onto the beach about six feet below. And in my drunken idiot state, I'm like, I can do that. So I try to do a flip off this boardwalk with these kids. Uh I have no gymnastic ability whatsoever. I get sideways. (laughs) I try and plant my arm to catch myself and totally break my arm, both, both bones in the wrist. Wow. Um, I get it. I get it set by a Mexican doctor who messes it up. Oh, you didn't even come back across the border. You (laughs) (laughs) did. No. (laughs) I, I'm telling you, man, my buddies, uh, my buddies joke, you know, there's the easy way to do things, the hard way to do things. And then there was Jay Redmond's way. Like, that's funny. Like if there is a path someplace that you look at it and you're like, okay, so, you know, there's like the nice paved sidewalk. And then there's like, you know, the bridge that, you know, it's like a rope bridge to get across. And you're like, yeah, you know, but I could take that way. And then you look over here and there's like, there's like a path on fire with broken glass and razor blades. You'd be like, oh yeah, that's Jay's path. (laughs) And I would have taken it. That's crazy. Because I was just a knucklehead. (laughs) So anyways, anyways, I I made it back to training. They had to re-break my arm. I had to go to, uh, I had to go to Balboa and like weeks later they had to re-break my arm. And I think the doctor knew I had done it being stupid because they didn't give me any pain meds whatsoever. That dude, they put my hand in this finger trap you know it's like this thing with springs that holds your hand to put traction like on it <laughs> yeah and then he literally proceeded to re-break my oh my god oh. it was ridiculous it's, <laughs> so uh, uh, and, and you know went back to buds and they were they read they saw right through that you know uh i basically made up a story how i broke my arm and i think you know the instructors were no dummies man they saw right through it and they were like roger that well you have i think they gave me two weeks from the time my cast was off to class back up oh wow so i class back up and uh struggled but i was i was going to make it through training i failed a lot of the evolutions just because my arm was so withered and and weak but i just pushed and would get punished and then push and get punished yeah so uh graduated training got to the seal teams and then really started to excel and do well um like i said continue to grow a little bit of arrogance and uh did several deployments um to south america doing counter drug stuff down there um back then we called it um you know that that's another thing with 9/11 pre 9/11 um the military back then didn't have a lot of guys that were doing real world operations so um oftentimes you would especially in the special operations community you would look at what team was working where and what part of the world potentially had conflict and what you were hoping for is that that conflict would bubble up or or blow up while you were there so we called it war chasing and uh we signed up to do right yeah exactly and you know people sometimes have a hard time understanding that you know a lot of um individuals out there that have never been in the military and just you know they're like oh my god why would you do that and i said well you have to understand that you trained at this highest level um day in and day out you were training you know often 12 15 sometimes 18 hour days um, with some of the best, most disciplined, hardest, aggressive individuals on the planet. And you were being taught these incredibly deadly surgical skills. Um, and it would be, so you were able to operate at this very high level. Um, 
So it would be the equivalent of training to the level of being an NFL football team and then never being allowed to play a game. Yeah. That's a good analogy. That's a great analogy, actually. So you were hungry to play. You wanted to be, you were like, I want to get out there and play. I want to prove that I can play with the Ravens or the Broncos or the Patriots, you know? And um, so, yeah, you would chase it. You would be like, where can I go where I get to prove my skills? And uh, at that time, you know, Colombia was a really dangerous place. Uh, The drug wars were really heavy underway. Um, the, the FARC were the, um, the paramilitary that really ran a lar- or owned a large part of the country down in uh, southern Colombia. And uh, they were uh, helping to support the drug. Uh, they were funding themselves through the, the drug war that was down there. So uh, America was really contributing a lot of dollars to try and fight this, both for the war front and both to help Colombia. So we were doing different things down there, and that was kind of my first taste of um, conflict. And the first time, you know, I was kind of introduced to the fact that, hey, guess what, man? This isn't G.I. Joe anymore. You know, this is for real. Um, I remember one of the first things we did, we were placing sensors along a river monitoring some traffic that was going through there. And we placed these sensors and then you know, I don't know, three or four days later, we went back and, you know, we were in our boats, we got off, we patrolled back in to get these things. And my senior, my senior chief goes, Hey, new guy, go get that sensor. And I'm like, Roger that. I don't think twice about it. I'm just like starting to, you know, bebop up there. And he goes, Hey, hey, hey. he's like, Hey man, you need to look for all these booby traps. You need to look for this. You need to look for that. You need to look for this because if the FARC find anything, they'll booby trap it and, you know, it'll blow you up and kill you. All right, go get it. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> He's like, nah, bro, go get it. Come on. And I'm like, whoa, senior chief, booby traps? I don't like, I, I, hey, man, I don't know how to do that. Right. And he's like, come on, man, you got this. Situational awareness, bro. You got it. I got faith in you. We're going to stand about 100 yards away, okay? <laughs> hey, man, if you get blown up, call us. We'll come get you. <laughs> and I'm like, so, messed up. So, so I walk up. I, you know, I get up there and I'm like, I, I, I feel like I'm Indiana Jones walking, you know, like every stick that breaks, I'm like, Oh God, uh, you know, <laughs> mission impossible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, I, he, you know, hindsight being 2020, he was right. I mean, the FARC does do things like that. Probably very unlikely and that it would have happened. I mean, you know, have situational awareness. I, I think they were screwing with me, but uh, uh it, it it is legitimate those things happen so that was kind of my first introduction and then you know more things happened on that trip it was about a five-week trip that we were deep in you know uh, a pretty dangerous area in colombia and um uh one of the colombians was um shot and killed um so that was kind of my first introduction to somebody being dead um and you know when you did the surgery when you had to do the uh the trick yeah exactly because the colombians brought him to us and and you know it's interesting when you're in a third world country they they, it's almost like they think you're miracle workers they like bring this guy to us and they're like fix him yeah and we're like uh check his pulse yeah no nothing (laughs) and they're like fix him (laughs) so we're like okay let's go through the motions let's see what we can do you know our the senior chief he was a medic and he's like all right well here let's do this let's do that and yeah we got uh crike him uh which for those that don't know uh uh, a cricothyroidotomy is where you cut into the cartilage in the throat to bypass the the um you know your mouth and nasal passageways to basically have a direct airflow to the lungs and uh, it's utilized when there's been damage to the face or the airway. So, uh, so we, um, so we got to do that. I got to do that, and uh, it was just interesting. One, it gave me an amazing appreciation right then and there for trauma medicine, which made me want to become a medic later. Yeah. Although we were overmanned, and I never got to do that, but it gave me this fascination with medicine from that day. It made me realize how both fragile the human body is, and how amazingly resilient it is, and how incredible it is that we, you know, we train all this time to try and kill people, but then we have this other amazing skill where we can save people yeah. um so uh, that we um fast forward to a different part of the trip a little bit further along um the farc oftentimes would just shoot into the camp they would just 
you know, it was like a drive-by shooting, if you will, you know, jungle style. <laughs> and they would just shoot into the camp. And just to test the defenses of the camp, they'd right. want to see what the reaction time was. And their, um, their I mean, I got to give it to the Colombians, man. Their reaction to it was uh, uh, unleash hell in 360-degree directions. <laughs> So that, um, so I got to back up for a second how that developed. So we were getting intelligence that there was a 400 man FARC element moving towards the camp. So our headquarters was like, hey, we're worried about you guys because you're like this small team. You're there. If this, if FARC attacks and, you know, this camp, you know, you guys are going to be overrun. So like we're starting to prep now. Like, you know, we're going through our E&E plan. And uh, so, what had happened so we're literally sleeping in our gear weapons slung ready to go at any moment so one night that's exactly what happened the fark shot did their drive-by shooting into the camp and they unleashed hell so you wake up in the middle of the night and like you know you've got 50 cows on the four corners you have 60s they're lobbing 40 mike mike up into the air they're lobbing 40 mike mike golden eggs uh you know explosive rounds out into the jungle i mean it just sounds like it, there is a war going on around you and you're both jacked up and your heart's racing and you know you're like all right what do we do and you know my senior chief's like get ready to zero eyes the radios and then take this thermite grenade and if i tell you you're gonna destroy the radios and i'm like i felt like back in that moment when he's like yeah go get that booby i'm like what <laughs> he's like yeah we may have to go on escape and evasion and i'm like so what it's funny yeah here? so i'm like, yeah exactly i'm like dude i'm 20 years old i mean what <laughs> <laughs> and uh and the plan literally was to like destroy everything and jump in the river and swim away to a different point but um it, it turned out that they were just testing the defenses and um and nothing happened you know we ended up they did you know they went out and did some reconnaissance and really didn't find anything so but this was kind of my introduction to uh what you know combat could be and the fact that guess what you know this is a uh it's a deadly game you know it is a real game and or it is a real thing and uh it is not a game and people can die um so and you would have think that that would have given me a better appreciation to maybe humble my ego a little bit. It yeah. didn't. Instead, it, I think it did a little bit of the opposite. It, you know, I'm like, hey, man, you know, nothing's going on in the world and I got a taste of the real thing. Yeah. Um, so continued on, continued on to excel, uh, but a little bit of the ego was getting uh, the worst of me. And uh, I got recommended for a commissioning program. And um my my dad was an officer my grandfathers were officers and there was nothing going on so yeah. once again still pre 911 and i was kind of at a decision point for my career um i just met my wife so my options were do i try and go to a higher level seal team or do i um go down this commission road and having just met my wife uh you know we had my son i was like you know maybe now would be a good time to go to school yeah. I had finished up a uh, stint in training. So I applied for a commissioning program. And um, our team did something that other teams did not do. Typically, it's the officers that uh, screen enlisted to become an officer within the team. Well, our team did something a little different. Uh, they We had a two-selection process. You went before the senior enlisted first, and they basically said, you know, yes, we think this guy would be a good officer. And then you went before the officers. Well, the chiefs voted against me. They said, no, we don't think you'd be a good officer. You're a knucklehead. Oh, really? You're that, you're that idiot that'll climb through the, uh, you know, the razor blade fire pit. <laughs> you know, we don't need officers like that. <laughs> right. You know, and I, you know, I, I was, I was a knucklehead. I had gotten myself in trouble several times and they brought those things up. They said, Hey, we think you could be a good chief. Uh, we don't think you'd be a good officer. And my ego got the best of me. I mean, and I was like, well, you know, who are you? And, um, uh, thankfully, uh, my commanding officer actually said, well, you know what? I see something in this kid. So I'm going to, I'm going to go against you and I'm going to pick him up for this program. So i I got picked up for the commissioning program. I went to school, um, crushed school, graduated, uh, number one in my class. 
uh, and got ready to come back to the SEAL teams. Um, while I was at school, though, 9-11 happened during the time I was at school. And I actually tried to drop the program. It actually happened right after I started school. Wow. I started school uh, July of 2001. And obviously, we know what happened in September. So went back to my SEAL team probably on September 13th, I think. And to my commanding officer that was there, my old SEAL team, and I said, I want to drop this program. I want to come back. I know we're going to war. You know, I want to be part of it. And uh, he was by far probably the best leader I've ever seen. Um, and amazingly, I mean, just the most prophetic advice I've ever heard. He looked at me and he said, you know, Red, he said, this isn't a war that's going to be over overnight. He said, this war will go on for decades. Oh, wow. And uh, he said, we need good leaders. He said, go back to school, finish the program. He said, and I guarantee you, you will get your opportunity. And, uh, and <laughs> God dang, I mean, you look at that now and you're like, holy shit, man on the mountain in a cave <laughs> wisdom yeah. here. Yeah, and sure. he really was, I mean, he was just an amazing, and he saved my career on several that later, I'll tell you the story, how he saved my career. So, um, so I did, I went back to school and I focused on school and excelled, finished number one. And then, but interestingly enough, when I, got commissioned in 2004, um, I had continued to ride this high um, of leadership and man, you know, I'm just a man. And this is where there's a dangerous side of leadership where I guess you rest on, the, the, what I did is I really kind of tried to rest on my laurels a little bit. I came back to the SEAL teams thinking, hey, look at me. I excelled as an enlisted guy. Look at me. I excelled in, you know, the ROTC program. Uh, so I'll be able to come back to the SEAL teams and excel there too without a whole lot of effort. And uh, it, it kind of, I stepped in, I created a little bit of my own or the situation around me created a little bit of the perfect storm. Uh, so what had happened overnight is that when 9-11 occurred, prior to 9-11, the SEAL teams had been operating on old tactics. We'd been operating, really the last time we had been in any kind of prolonged war was in Vietnam. And we were still operating off a lot of those old tactics yeah. uh, that we were training with. Um, we had not really developed any kind of intense urban warfare tactics we had not developed intense long-range mobility operations in in uh especially in rugged mountainous terrain we had not developed uh tactics for those types of things so um <laughs> obviously we figured things out real quick that these old tactics weren't working so there was a sh a dynamic shift in the seal teams over those first few years after 911 we quickly realized all these old tactics we were using didn't work so i show back up in 2004 thinking i'm the man and you know here i am i left the seal teams as a guy with a lot of experience and came back and you know probably at this point uh, 60 to 70 percent of the SEAL teams had combat experience yeah. and these were the guys I was stepping in and leading and instead of humbling myself and being like hey man I, I really don't have combat experience I'd like to learn from you instead I was a you know just a knucklehead and you know I was uh insecure honestly and was like oh well I'm just gonna have to you know show how good I am to prove to these guys I have what it takes also and, you know, I think there's a natural tendency when you hang on really tight, you just end up messing up more. So I'm trying to learn new tactics. I'm trying to lead and I'm just messing up is what was happening. If I had relaxed and just said, hey, man, can you teach me this? Or, hey, can you show me how to do this? But I was too proud. Yeah. I was too proud. All that arrogance had built itself to a point that I wasn't willing to humble myself and say, hey, man, I don't know how to do this. You know, you know, um, so. And then this led to the next uh, downfall is because I was screwing up and, you know, beating myself up over it and alienating myself from guys I knew, I started drinking. Yep. 
So started drinking uh, in our off time and, you know, like drinking heavily and just making an ass of myself. So, you know, strike one, I'm not being a good leader and leading by example. It tactically strike two, I'm, I'm a jackass drinking. Yeah. Um, so all of these things were damaging my credibility as a leader. And one of the things that I talk to people about in, in leadership is credibility is the currency of leadership. Um, everything you do, whether you are on duty, whether you're off duty, if you are a leader, people, every comment that comes out of your mouth, people judge it through the lens of leadership. You're our leader. You know, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. Did you hear what he said? Well, you know, we were at his house. It doesn't matter. You know, yep. once you put on that leadership hat, people look at you as a leader. It's just like as a dad, you know, you know, we all remember the first time we ever heard our dad cuss and we're like, oh my God, dad cussed. How did that happen? <laughs> you know, he's our dad. I mean, dad doesn't cuss. Right. You know, dad's a man like everybody else, but he will always be dad and we will see him through that lens. And just like as a leader, uh, we expect our leaders to lead at all times. And, you know, that was one of the things that I really was failing at. And all of that kind of came to a head on a mission in Afghanistan where uh, I made a bad call. You know, I, I gave up the high ground to try and uh, uh, the reasoning was good, uh, but my motivation for the reasoning was bad. I remember this part in the book. Yeah, because... Yeah, you know, our, our guys got into a firefight, they were pinned down and we, I was in an overwatch position that was the closest to them and actually had good communications. Whereas because of the terrain where we were at, a lot of people didn't have communications with them. So I made a, uh, I made a split decision that I was going to take myself and my machine gunner down into this valley to provide machine gun support. It was a bad call. Um, for a multitude of different reasons, we, we would have had, you know, two different maneuvering elements in unknown terrain in very heavy enemy territory. I did not know that we had air assets that were coming into the area that were getting ready to, uh, to put down, yeah. um, uh, you know, to put down ordinance to try and push back the enemy. Um, but really what makes it a terrible decision is I did it for myself. I wanted to get into the fight. At this point, I had been on the edge of firefights. You know, we had, I, we had laid down suppressing fire, uh, but I, I wanted to get in the fight. I wanted to be there and slap the dragon and prove, oh, I, you know, I can do this. I, you know, I honestly, um, when I look at it now, I look at it as, did I see this as like this shortcut to leadership? Hey, look at me. I ran to the sound of the guns and, you know, I stepped in and saved the day or whatever, you know, bullshit reasons that we tell ourselves. Um, but it was, it was, it was a bad reason. And I'm very fortunate that nothing happened. You know, that yeah. we didn't get engaged in a separate engagement. You know, now we've got two firefights going on in different areas. Um, so the bottom line is nothing happened. We get to the bottom, get back up on communications to ground force commanders, breathing fire into the radio, get your ass out of that valley. We're trying to bring in air support and we didn't know where you are. So get up here so we can get a full head count. We can, uh, we can do this. So scamper up out of the valley and, uh, and, you know, he came up to me immediately, the ground force commander, and was like, you know, what the hell were you thinking? And instead of, once again, humbling myself and being like, you know what, you're right, that was a bad call. I'm, I apologize. I fought back and was like, oh, I did the right thing. You know, I don't know why you're so uptight. You know, I ran to the sound of the guns. I went down to support the guys, and he, like, lost it. He was like, you're out of here. I'm sending you back to Bagram because we were operating down in Helmand at this time. And, uh, I was like, wait, what? And he was like, yeah, I'm sending you back. You're going to go talk to the CO. And I think it was at that point that I was like, holy shit, you know? Um, but then I, I tamped that down and was like, no, man, you did the right thing. You did the right thing. You know, you'll get in front of the CO. You'll be vindicated. You'll give me your story. And, uh, so got back, uh, to base and basically told the CO my side and he said, okay, you know, we'll, 
I'll wait till your guys get back and we'll hear both sides of the story. And that was miserable because uh, I think I waited an additional couple of days, <laughs> at least maybe two, three days before they got back. And I really started to kind of beat myself up at that point. You know, because it's kind of like back when your your dad sent you to your room when you were a kid and you were oh, yeah. waiting for him to get home. And, a lot of time to think about uh, it. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like what's going to happen. Yeah, totally. And, um, and, as, and even when the guys got back, I think it was still an additional day or two. And then I was starting to hear the rumblings that my platoon chief uh, wanted me out. You know, he's like, he should go before a Trident review board. He's dangerous. Um, I heard the rumors of they were calling me Rambo Red, uh, you know, which is not a compliment uh, in a in a very team based uh, organization. And. uh, And, you know, this was (laughs) starting to set in, but I still fought against it. I still was like, ah, you did the right thing. So needless to say, I went before the, um, you know, I sat down with the CO and, you know, my platoon chief, ground force commander, and basically they laid it out. I fought against it. And the CO finally said, listen, here's a deal. You know, you've been making, um, you've made good decisions and you've made bad decisions. And right now your leadership abilities, your tactical abilities have been called into question. And he said, if Anybody had been killed because of your actions, I'd be pushing you out, he said. But uh, he said, I think you have potential. And uh, so, you know, you're, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, you know, erase any awards you would have got from this deployment. Uh, You are going to get a letter of um, reprimand that we're not going to put in your, we're not going to put it in your record because that would have been the end of my career as an officer. But he said, what we're going to do is here's this, here's this letter, you know, here it is, you know, and I'm giving it to the incoming commanding officer. And he said, it's going to sit in his safe and you are going to prove over this next platoon cycle as a, you know, assistant platoon commander that you have the ability to lead at the level we need you to, uh, and that you can prove to us that we can trust you, uh, you know, uh, in this job. He said, the last thing we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to send you to uh U S army ranger school. <laughs> I was like, wow. what? <laughs> oh, wow. So he said, after we get back, uh, you know, and it was at this point, it was, um, you know, October. And he said, we're going to get back. You'll go through the holidays. And as soon as holidays are done, you're going to, you know, head to ranger school. So, uh, and I was, and you know, what's funny, I probably should have walked out of that and been happy and thankful, you know, oh man, you know, I dodged a bullet there and I wasn't, I was angry. I was bitter. I, I still saw myself as a victim that I did the right thing and I was thrown under the bus and still refusing to accept, um, the decisions that I had made really that had led up to that. So, um, get home and you know, don't really have my head in the game at home. And I'm just, yeah, I'll go to ranger school. No problem. I'll kick this and, you know, I'll kick this course in the ass. It'll be easy. I made it through buds, ranger school, you know, ranger school is going to be a joke. So I check into ranger school in February, uh, the very beginning of February, uh, with a really bad attitude thinking this is going to be super easy. And, uh, yeah, to all my rangers out there, mad props to you guys. Ranger school is not easy. Buds is still harder, but, uh, <laughs> but Ranger school is a, uh, it's a great school and it is a very hard school. And, um, and I checked in, uh, and I'll be honest, man, I, I was a dick. Um, you know, these young kids were like, Oh man, you're a seal. And I was like, yeah, beat it. Leave me alone. Um, I didn't try and be a team player in any way whatsoever. I just kind of thought to myself, I'm just going to, drive through this school and with this bad attitude and just stay away from me, you know, yeah, uh, really living up to the Rambo red, um, uh, nickname. Yeah. Nickname. So, uh, we got to, I guess, I don't know, maybe Thursday of week one and they had the uh, land navigation course and I, (laughs) and I taught land navigation, like, you know, I know how to navigate. 
But um, we, you know, typical ranger school fashion, you know, you start the day at like 3 a.m. and they make you stand around for hours doing nothing. And uh, a little known fact about Fort Benning, Georgia, is I think that the air is piped in from Antarctica (laughs) because in the winter it is brutally cold. And it was absolutely frigid that morning. Uh, it must have been, I don't even know, 10 degrees. It was frigid. So, so we get off the bus and the instructor to start the land nav course and the instructors are like, take off your snivel gear. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me, man. You know, you, you, you know, you're going to freeze and they're, and they're like, take off your snivel gear, you know, your warm gear that you have. And I, you know, like an idiot, like an idiot. You know, I'm like, I'm like pissed off about this. Uh. So I allowed it to, the, the whole thing kind of was a breaking point in my mind. Like, this is so stupid. What, the whole reason I'm here, you know, I'm, you know, I've been in for 13 years. It was all about me, 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 me. You know, I had, you know, so I stomped around the woods for a while with my little, you know, Ranger Red temper tantrum. And basically was like, I'll just wait for the sun to rise and then I'll smoke check this course. I'll just blast right through it. Um, but it, it is, it is, a, it's a long course. I think you have to get five points in order to pass. Um, and if you get six points, you get a major plus, which is a big deal in ranger school. So uh, needless to say, uh, I'm getting close to the, the end time and I've only got... Um, I think I only had three points. I was up to, and I was moving. I think I got the fourth point and then the time was up and I had to go, I had to go turn in my card and, uh, turn in my card and, you know, had failed. And the instructors were just like heckling me and just giving me oh Navy boy, you know, we're not surprised you guys can't navigate. And I snapped. And at that moment I was like, screw you guys, you know, screw this course. I'm done. And they were like, what did you quit? And I was like, I'm done, man. And they were like, Roger that. We'll be glad to take you back. You know, they were all happy. And uh, they said, you need to go speak to the Ranger Colonel um, the next morning, you know, if that's what you want to do. And I said, yep. So, you know, this is where uh, as humans, we are a very interesting species because we listen to that stupid little voice in our head that... um, often distorts reality. Oh, totally. And that's really what was going on with me at that time. I was, one, trying to create excuses for my decision, for my ridiculously poor emotional leadership, um, for my poor mental leadership at that point. And basically, on top of all that, I was telling myself, well, you know, it doesn't really matter because with all the mistakes you've made, the guys are never going to follow you again. You know, no matter you, you know, no matter what you do, you're never going to go back to the SEAL teams and, and the guys are going to follow you because of the mistakes you've made. That's what I was telling myself. So, um, so yeah, literally that night I called my wife and was like, yeah, I'm coming home. And she was like, what? And I said, yeah, you know. I'm coming home. I've decided, you know, I'm going to get out of the military because I knew that was it. That would end in my career. So uh, the next day I had to go see the Ranger Colonel. And, you know, he's like, I gave him this sob story, this victim story, you know, thrown under the bus, all this crap that we tell ourselves. And uh, finally, he's like, do you want to talk to, is there anybody you want to talk to? And I was like, no, (laughs) it's nobody I want to talk to, man. You know, I had never quit anything in my entire life up to this point. And uh, so deep down inside, you know, I was ashamed. I was ashamed of it. And um, and he said, well, you know, I've got a good friend who is a good leader. You know, do you want to talk to him? And I was like, listen, man, there is nobody in the SEAL teams I want to talk to. And he's like dialing the phone. He's like, yeah, you know, this guy's really great. And he's like, you know, hey, Vince, what's going on? You know, hey, it's Colonel so-and-so. And he's like, hey, here you go, man, Vince Peterson. So Vince Peterson was my CO at my old team who oh, got wow. me commissioned, who yeah. went against the Chiefs, who basically told me stay in school because this is a war that's going to be going on for decades. And this dude hands the phone to me 
And I'm like, what are the odds? I mean, because I would not have spoke to anybody, but I had so much respect for this guy. Like I could not, not take the phone. So I got the phone and he's like, what's going on? And, you know, basically gave him this sob story and he, he just broke it down. I mean, he was just such an effective leader. He was able to quickly get to the root of the problem and really quickly to get the root of your problem and how to look at it. And, um, and the, and the root of the problem was for me is I had convinced myself that it didn't matter what I did, that I could not come back and lead that guys wouldn't follow me, that they'd never trust me again. And he gave me the most, um, the most vital leadership advice I've ever been given in my life. And even to this day, I feel like it's the most vital leadership advice. He said, red people will follow you if you give them a reason to. He said, so go back and crush this course and come back to the SEAL teams and lead and people will follow you. And I was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, (laughs) roger that. (laughs) So I like handed the phone back and I was like, hey, uh, Colonel, can I get back in my class? And he's like, nope, sorry, dude. He's like, your class is gone. That bus has driven away. You, my friend, get to go sit in Ranger School Jail for the next month, and then we'll let you class up with the next class. Go, go sit in timeout, and you can think about it for a while. Yep. And I'll be honest, that probably was the best thing that ever could have happened to me, uh, because for a month, I kicked myself, and honestly, I really started to peel apart who the hell Jay Redmond was. Um, and, and, you know, this arrogance that I had carried for years, you know, this thought that, man, I'm better than other people. Um, this, and I, I just started to peel back this onion, um, of the mistakes that I'd made and, you know, this, this victim mentality and quickly began to realize that dude, you know, you put yourself here, all these decisions you made led you to being here. Um, you know, so, uh, and, and it was a good thing. I mean, it was a good thing for the first time in my life. I kind of, by the time I classed up again, I was like, all right, you know, (laughs) take two, Um, you know, and it's going to be about uh, how I lead myself. Number one, you know, three rules of leadership that I started to live by, you know, lead yourself, then lead others, you know, and uh, lead always. And uh, just drove forward from that point forward and really just kind of pivoted on, uh, on my career so awesome when you have like one person i can look at i can name like one person in my you know career in my life that they make a pivotal change in you by giving you a chance by changing by shifting your perspective a little bit and kind of waking you up to the idea of like dude what like get your head out of your ass you know what i mean because it is very easy to point fingers at other people as to why you're failing at certain things whether it be in a position of leadership or otherwise and to not go internal with it and realize that the common denominator is you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's so, so much easier to blame somebody else or another well, circumstance. Well, and it's the common whatever. thing that happens. Right. I mean, for a lot of people that becomes the go-to, we look at the external factors that cause the problem when 95% of the time it's us. Yeah, totally. You know, um, you know, Jocko talks about that in his book, the principle of extreme ownership, that everything we do as a leader, um, if there is a failure out there, you know, 95% of the time it's, it's on us, you know, even if there's a failure within your team, well, did you provide the right guidance? Did you provide the right resources? Did you provide the right motivation? Did you, you know, you as a leader do all those things, uh, the right level of management, the right level of oversight, you know, did you build the right team? All these things come back on you. And, uh, and I think that's an amazing principle. And there's a lot of leaders out there who do not live that way. They live, you know, Hey, if there's a problem, it's not my fault. You know, that it's that arrogant ego, ego driven leader. Yeah. Uh, and the best leaders are the ones that, you know, and that's what I came to learn. They place themselves last in the equation. Did so you feel like, did you feel like Ranger school though? When you were, when you got through it, did you feel like, uh, cause I've heard a lot of people say that Ranger school is a leadership school. Yes. And uh, I feel like that's where uh, I've heard that a lot of people go there to become better leaders, basically. And and it does a great job at that. It really does. Uh, It's a phenomenal school. Uh, It it forces you to lead in 
uncomfortable, stress uh, loaded situations. Right. And, uh, and and it's great because that's exactly what we need in combat and and that further carries on to you know how you lead in life so went on from there um thankfully excelled came back and you know stayed very humble and was not afraid to you know ask other guys hey man how do i do this how do i do that and um was very fortunate enough that my new boss was an ex-enlisted guy also and a really solid squared away ex-enlisted guy and he sat me down on day one and he said hey man i know what happened in in afghanistan and i don't care he said you know whatever happened in your past in your past from here it's day you know all i care about is what you do from this point forward and he's like you know i'm going to give you responsibility and i'm going to push you uh, and help you, you know, lead and excel. And he did, man. Every chance in training, he would look for opportunities, and he'd be like, you know, he'd push me. And he, he, he I mean, he was a smart guy. He was totally helping me because one, it was boosting my confidence that really I'd been kind of shattered. Really? And he was also showing the guys that I was leading, hey, this guy's good. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Um, so it started to build better rapport. I started to build, you know, the trust with the team. And by the time we got through that workup and ready to go to deployment, I mean, we were a solid, solid, it was the best, um, you know, troop I had ever been a part of in the best platoon. Um, and, you know, showed up in Iraq and, you know, now it's 2007, which, you know, height of the Ambar awakening, just heavy, heavy combat. And we hit the ground running and we're just awesome slaying dragons. Yeah. Um, you know, multiple firefights and multiple things that happened and, um, you know, went through all that and I guess I'll fast forward. So here I'll fast forward to, I guess, two critical points. One, we got into a really big firefight in, uh, in June in Iraq and very complicated, uh, multiple enemy positions. We had women and children that were on the target. Mm. Um, we were spread out across multiple buildings in a very large compound. And, um, and my team and I had to deal with all that. We had wounded, we had several, a couple of SEALs who were wounded, and our interpreter was pretty badly wounded from uh, grenades that were being dropped down on us from a rooftop. So we, we, we navigated this uh, situation and I managed, you know, with my team to get everybody out of there and neutralize the enemy that was kind of barricaded on top of this building. And, uh, and it was a huge win. I mean, the guys were like, man, red kicked ass. He did a great job. So for me, it was this, you know, coming full circle after having this failure point as a young leader, um, to having this redemption point and, you know, like, Hey man, you can do this. You know, you have the ability to do this. Um, it was awesome. You know, I had redeemed myself, was tracking. Uh, I had applied at that point to go to our next tier of team, uh, and was going to come back from that deployment to do that. And, um, in a week, uh, before we left, we got tasked for another mission and uh you know high uh, high level guy that we'd been tracking all the deployment and uh you know long story short through a sequence of events basically walked into a very well executed ambush yep. and uh myself and several of my teammates were shot up in this ambush um and the way the ambush unfolded they had managed to lure us around into the kill zone where there was nothing but open desert for thousands of yards behind us. So, you know, this firefight erupts, you know, we are literally only about 25 meters away from an embedded enemy force and kind of some dense vegetation. So we're kind of right up against the edge of the vegetation and they were back probably about 10 you know, maybe five yards and, you know, they, I don't know, they had built these fighting positions or something, but it's two, uh, PKM machine guns. And then I don't, you know, we estimate 12, 13 AK shooters and, uh, and yeah, it's point blank. We're like 50 feet away from these guys and they're just, you know, strafing us. Um, so I, um, immediately, you know, <laughs> looked for cover 
right. and there's nothing. Right. Um, and I kind of glanced back to the left and there was a large tractor tire about 15 yards uh, to the left of me and back. And our guys started to fall back to that. I was trying to lay down fire and that's when I initially got strafed by the machine gun across my body armor and took two rounds in the elbow, uh, which I thought shot that arm off. Um, tried to continue to fight and shoot and, uh, was yelling at our guys. Um, and at that point they turned both machine guns on me and I took, uh, I took rounds off my body armor. I took rounds off my helmet. I had my left night vision tube shot off. I was taking rounds off my gun and, um, and I, I, um, that's, that's when I got shot in the arm. Uh, that's when I took the rounds in the arm actually. And then I turned, um, to try and move back to that tire, recognizing, man, you're in a bad situation. And I had a round come from the side that caught me right under, or it caught me right in front of my ear. It traveled through my face and exited the right side of my nose, taken Mm -hmm. off most of my nose, uh, blew out my right cheekbone. It broke the, what was left of my cheek and kind of kicked it out to the right it, um, it, uh, the bullet traveled right under my eye. So it, the overpressure blew out my orbital floor, um, you know, and, and then the eye kind of dropped down into this hole. Yeah. Uh, it shattered my jaw. It broke all the bones above my eye sure. and it, uh, it knocked me out. So, you know, here I am sleeping on the job out front and uh <laughs> and and uh the guys but they saw me uh they, they thought i was dead you yeah. know they thought i'd been hit and was dead in the darkness and i you know that firefight lasted about 40 minutes so to this day i don't know how long uh from the point i was hit i was hit all in the first few minutes of the firefight probably in the first five minutes of the firefight i was hit um so I, who knows was i unconscious for five minutes ten minutes i don't know but when i came to um i was laying flat on my back and literally watching um i came to and couldn't quite put two and two together at first i was you know really my bell had been rung pretty badly and i yeah. was trying to figure out one i knew i was severely hurt i was like i am messed up right now um and Two, I was like, okay, Iraq, firefight, okay, you've been shot. Yeah, but I couldn't quite figure out where, why I was so messed up. And then I started to notice, um, you know, tracer fire directly over me. So literally, I had, uh, when I was hit, I had fallen on my back, and now they were literally having this firefight directly over me. Um, so uh, <laughs> thankfully, I, was, I had enough sense in the moment to think okay don't sit up yeah so that was kind of the first thought and then uh and then my second thought was man i'm um i've been shot i my arm's been shot off uh which i had thought and i don't know what happened i don't know if maybe when i fell i landed on top of my arm because when i reached over i couldn't feel it and my nerves were totally done i didn't feel anything in that arm so I was once again convinced, okay, your, your arm shot off. You've got to get a tourniquet on. And I, I couldn't get my tourniquet on. Um, and I knew the guys couldn't come get me in the middle of this firefight because they'd be shot too. So, you know, it sucked. I'm just like, man, I just got to sit here and wait. Are you the only one that shot at this point or are there multiple guys that no, shot No, multiple guys had been shot. But they had managed to fall back behind the tire. Uh, and I was shot in the face, you know, as I tried right to make my way all. back. So now I'm I'm pinned down about 15 yards in front of them, 10, 10 yards in front of them. So, um, so um, you know, laying there and just thinking, geez, you know, you got to just got to wait. <laughs> <laughs> I had the chills listening to this part of the book because it's crazy to me the mindset that you had, the wherewithal to be like having some of the thoughts that you did, you know, like being like, wow, like I need to get my tourniquet on because my arm is blown off. And then you're telling your buddy like, hey, man, like can you grab my arm? Like I don't want to leave my arm and my helmet here because you think it's it's not attached to you. And just all these thoughts that you had while you were laying there. It's like, dude, that <laughs> I can't even imagine. I think it's like it's hard to even imagine being in that situation and coming back from that. 
and being where you are today. It's it's a trip. It, that's bl- still bless, me. man. I mean, that's really and, and and that's what it came down to. I mean, I literally ble- you know started to bleed out. I lost a ton of blood, um, and and reached a point where I was like, oh, I'm dying. You know, this shit, this is where I'm checking out. I got nothing left. I mean, every breath was, um, just took all the energy in me just to take a breath and I couldn't move anything. I couldn't feel anything. And I finally kind of said, well, this is, uh, this is where you're checking out. And, you know, it's interesting. This is really where I talk a lot about the, the, the overcome mindset. Cause I truly believe, um, you know, you cannot, we can't beat death, but I think individuals can push. I mean, you definitely learn it in SEAL training. You learn it in a lot of different trainings where the mind can do so much more than the body is capable of. And, and granted, we can't beat certain physiological laws. I mean, we need to have so much, you know, blood pressure and all these things. But I do believe that you can, you know, you can give in to shock and just die. Uh, but maybe you could have lived another 20 minutes if you didn't give into that. Yeah. Um, if you at least tried to hold on. And I think that's the only thing that kept me alive was that mindset uh, of just, you know, I, I was going to go home. I got, you know, I thought about my wife. I thought about my kids. I got angry um, that I had allowed myself to get into that situation I asked for help from the big man above and, uh, and I, and I got it. I got strength and this thought popped into my head about, um, I had seen the show Baghdad ER and on that show, they talked about that. Um, if our wounded warrior showed up into the combat support hospital with a pulse, they had a 90% chance of making it home alive. And I was like, dude, I am going to show up with a pulse. You know, if I have to reach into my chest cavity and squeeze my heart myself, I am going to show up with a pulse. So I was just telling myself, stay awake, stay alive, stay awake, stay alive. And, uh, you know, finally they won this fight. We called in the closest fire missions of the entire Iraq war. We literally called rounds in directly on our position and, um, got in the medevac, flew the rotors off, um, Interestingly enough, you know, you, 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 you see the world through your own lens, especially when you're messed up. And, um, you know, there are things you come to find out later that either weren't true or they just were different from the way they actually happened on the right. ground. So, um, one of those things was I was convinced I never lost consciousness. I mean, I got to Bethesda and they're like, how long were you out? And I was like, I was never out. I never lost consciousness. <laughs> I was, I was adamant about it. Right. And then when the guys got back and you know, they came to see me and somehow we got into that and they were like, what? They were like, dude, you were out for like, you know, we thought you were dead for like at least 10 minutes. And then you like drifted in and out of consciousness. So, yeah. so that was one thing, but I met the helicopter crew later. They were a, a TF 160th crew, um, you know, with a flight medic on board who I credit for saving my life, but they loaded all three of us onto the helicopter and because they weren't configured to handle three people, but we were also critical from the amount of blood we had lost. They just stuck us all in there. Well, they couldn't shut the door. So, uh, they, they were literally, they literally flew the rotors off to try and get us to Baghdad as quickly as possible. And what was happening was, um, I was um, closest, I was the furthest in the helicopter. They had me leaning up against the wall next to, um, you know, the uh, crew chief on one of the miniguns. And he, they told him, hey, keep him awake. And I guess, you know, so I don't remember any of this. Um, You know, (laughs) yeah, I was awake the whole time in the helicopter. (laughs) So what they had told me to do, and I only found out about this years later after I met the crew, they had me put my hand my good hand on my chest with my thumb up and that's how the flight medic would make sure i was still awake and if i drifted off or dropped it you know the crew chief would like slap me or you know yell at me hey i don't remember any of that that's not in the book because i didn't find that out until um years later probably 2015 i met the crew the other thing they told me was uh 
because the door was open, like when they landed, all that wind had come in and we were all, we were bleeding like stuck pigs. I mean, I had three gunshot wounds. Uh, our other guy had three gunshot wounds. Uh, our medic uh, almost got his leg severed from the wound that went through him. So the entire inside of the helicopter was just a pool of blood and the wind was cycling through. So it created this mist. So when they landed and got into the light, they were all coated in blood, the entire inside of the helicopter. They they said it took like a month of cleaning with Q-tips in every little nook and cranny, every dial to get all the blood out of the helicopter. And they didn't know who we were. They just knew we were seals who had been severely wounded. They didn't know, they didn't think I was going to survive. Uh, so it wasn't until years later that a friend of mine helped me track them down that that was the first time they ever found out that we survived. Wow. And, uh, so yeah, it was awesome to be able to thank them. And so, um, you know, anyways, I mean, you know, uh, I survived and it was, uh, but interestingly enough, you know, what I, what I, really started talking a lot about in the content that I'm delivering now is I survived a enemy ambush. Um, but what's interesting about an ambush, uh, an enemy ambush is that I stepped out of it into a life ambush. And I think that the mechanics of life ambushes are in some ways very similar to the mechanics of an ambush. It's designed to be unexpected and overwhelming and pin you on the spot. And hopefully, you know, the people that you're trying to ambush will just be overwhelmed and not fight back and stay on the X and wither up and die. Um, And life ambushes operate in many the same way. And I stepped out of this ambush to step into this one. And this ambush was, Hey, you have been, you're severely wounded, uh, you, you know, we're, I didn't lose my arm, but they started talking about amputating my arm right at the beginning. Uh, my face is blown out. I'm all mangled. And, um, that was a really hard thing to digest. I mean, here I was, I had ridden this incredible roller coaster of failure, uh, and rebuilding myself as a leader and coming to understand myself and, and then redemption and hitting this high point where now, you know, I'm trying to screen to go to our next level. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, being at the level that I could have done that, um, (laughs) and then being severely wounded where I'm too weak to even get out of bed without having nurses, um, help me go to the bathroom. So, interestingly enough, this second ambush, um, you know, we talk about how do you survive an ambush? Well, you have to get off the X. And I sat on the X for the first couple of days feeling sorry for myself, um, just trying to process what had happened. And as a lot of us do, reliving the moment Um, really more of the decision process. You know, why did we do this? Why did I do that? Man, I should have gone left. I, you know, I could have stepped right. You know, all these things that we all do when we dissect, you know, some sort of catastrophic event. And, um, after a few days, I just hit this point where I was like, stop it. This is accomplishing nothing. You know, you did everything according to our tactics. Um, you know, you can't, what if it, you can't go back and change it. What's happens happen. You know, you can't undo it. You know, the only thing you can do now is turn around and look at the future and how you shape your future. So you talk about the sign you put up. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. That 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 came right after that. Yeah. I really, so, I really like, I like that part. I was like, man, that is like intense and awesome. Well, it came, it came right after that. It was right after that. The next couple of days when I was like, dude, you have got to drive forward. And, uh, I had this, so that was kind of the next domino that fell. I had some people that came into the room who were expressing a lot of pity. And, um, and I, I had, 
they were having a conversation and I had started to drift off, but it's in that, you know, subconscious state where you're still kind of awake and you can hear what's going, but you know, you're starting to check out, you know, rubberneck state. Yeah, for sure. So, um, and they started to have a conversation about what a shame it was that, you know, these young men and women, we send them off to war and, you know, they come back and they're battered and broken and they'll never be a productive member of society. And, um, and they left and right about that time my wife came back into the room and you know and i had kind of digested all this and the more i thought about it the more it made me angry yeah and i said to her i said never again never again is somebody going to come into my room and feel sorry for me or have pity for me when i'm doing everything in my power you know to stay strong and not feel sorry for myself so that sign was just a stream of consciousness in the moment. I didn't give it a whole lot of thought. It was like, give me my paper. And it, I just wrote it out. I said, attention to all who enter here. If you're coming to this room with sadness or sorrow, don't bother. The wounds that I received, I got in a job that I love, doing it for people that I love, defending the freedom of a country I deeply love. I'll make a full recovery. What is full? That's the absolute utmost physically. I have the ability to recover. And then I'll push that about 10% further through sheer mental tenacity. This room you're about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense rapid regrowth. If you're not prepared for that, go elsewhere. Love it. And, uh, you know, we signed it, the management. And, uh, you know, I told my wife, hey, put this on the door. And the original sign was written on, I was doing all my writing on, um, it was like printer paper. It was a ream of printer paper. Right. And she put it on the door, and a couple of days later, somebody else came in and was having difficulties. Right. So I, after that, I said, go find the brightest piece of paper you can in this joint. <laughs> and she came back with that big orange neon piece of paper, and we transcribed it word for word onto that and put that on the door. And uh, a teammate, a couple of days later, took his trident off and tacked his trident into the door on it. And uh, it kind of took on a life of its own after that. Um, a New York firefighter who has since passed away, John Vigiano, took a picture of it and wrote a blog about it. Yeah. And that picture and blog went viral. And, um, and you know, it just, it's amazing. And so one of the biggest things I tell people about the sign is you never know the impact that you're going to have. I kind of try and categorize this under the idea of leading always. Um and the power of a positive overcome mindset because you never know the impact that you're going to have you know that sign initially i kind of wrote it to motivate myself and as this proclamation but that sign has gone on to have an impact on you know i don't know thousands and thousands and thousands of people if not maybe hundreds of thousands or millions at this point yep. um and, and it is motivated and inspired people. I never once in a second thought I would touch. You know, I didn't even think about that in the moment. It just was a statement that I am going to overcome. I am going to get past this. And, you know, you're not going to bring me down, you know, with your negativity and pity. I am going to own this path I'm going to walk. Love it, man. And um, so that's why I tell people, you know, you, you, you know, it's, it's hard and, and, it's hard in hard times not to focus on the negativity because oh, it is. Sure. You're going through this hell, this life ambush in the moment. But uh, your attitude will absolutely determine the outcome. I agree with that 100%. I think the uh, one of the things that I've struggled with as a result of going through some of the things I went through with my back surgeries and recovering you know, without pills and, and this and that was I struggled with like a, a lack of empathy uh, for other people because I didn't feel sorry for myself. I refused to feel sorry for myself. So it was hard for me to feel sorry for other people, like when they were being down on themselves and being negative. So that's been a growth thing for me, you know, as being like, hey, man, like not everyone's going to have the same circumstance and everybody's going to have the same mindset. Um, and you, everyone has a different story. You know, everybody has a different backstory. Everybody has a different uh, different things that they go through, you know, and not everybody's going to going to relate to the same things like a sign like that for me is extremely motivating, you know, but some people are, are they get stuck in their their pity and that's where they want to be, you know, and you just have to. Be like, okay, man, that's that's your thing. It's just not mine. Don't bring it around me because, like, I'm not that guy, you know? Yeah. Um, I want to push people and motivate people and inspire people, you know, not get trapped in that, that negative world, you know? I, I'm the same way. Yeah. Um, I, I think I am a little more empathetic. I recognize that some people's path takes a little longer. Where I have issues with is people who 
um, have a victim mentality who don't, they don't want to move out of it right. in any way whatsoever. They would rather sit there and be coddled. And um, unfortunately, I've seen some wounded warriors like this, which drives me crazy. Um, I'm just like, you know, no, no amount of, you know, you know, <laughs> no amount of trying to help them understand this is you, man. I hate to tell you, you know, nobody else is forcing you to be here. These issues that you're facing, they're you. Right. You know, you are the you you are you are pinning yourself on the X yep. and nobody can get you off it until you're willing to move off of it. Yep. And uh, and I've encountered that over the years and it, it is frustrating to me to watch it. Yeah, one of the uh, one a guy from from your guys from your community actually uh, explained it to me in a way that I thought was pretty brilliant. He said, "You know, people are at different stops in life." He's like, "If you picture your life being like a train stop, you know, he's like, you're at a certain stop where you understand things to be a certain way because of the things that you've experienced. So you can't expect other people to be at the train same train stop as you. Maybe you know you learn that on stop one, but it's going to take them till till stop six to figure it out. You know." And so that's been like my, my new thing of being like, okay, cool. You know, like don't get so frustrated with people, you know, when they, because I, I have a hard time with the victim mentality. I don't want to feel sorry for myself, you know? Yeah. So when other people do it, it's, it's a struggle for me to be like, okay, let me try and understand that they're not at the stop that I'm at right now. And hopefully I can, I can help them get to that stop where it's like, no, you're, you're the common denominator and attitude definitely a hundred percent determines the outcome, you know? And if you have a, a piss poor attitude, the outcome is probably gonna be the same, you know? You know, it's just the way the way the world works. Um, what do you think about uh, your whole injury and and everything you went through and what you're accomplishing now? How much of that do you think is mindset, in your opinion? Uh, the majority of it. I mean, you know, I think some people naturally have a a I don't know a predisposition to have um, I don't know a more jovial attitude or whatever it is in life. Right. I, I am, I am, I am not, um, I definitely sometimes have a negative attitude. Something can go wrong. And my first thought is, you know, a negative thought. So I know it is a choice to be positive. I know it is a choice to drive forward because it is something I work with myself all the time. You know, I talk, develop something called the Pentagon and peak performance. So physical leadership's component of it, but the next two tiers are mental and emotional leadership. So mental resiliency, educating yourself, learning what other skills are out there to make yourself better. And then emotional leadership, how we manage our emotions, that positive mindset, how we project that. I know, you know, because I'm, you know, go back all these stories of me as a young knucklehead, you know, that was poor mental leadership and poor emotional leadership. So now I'm older, you know, I could sit on the X and feel sorry for myself and, you know, oh, woe is me or any of this, but no. Um, One, I feel like it is incredible um, disrespectful to guys I serve with who didn't come home. Because they would give anything, you know, if they could do it over again to be home and say, I love you to my wife and kids just one more time, not even permanently, That's you. you know? Yeah. So I just, I, I, I just think individuals who can't look at it through that lens, like, hey man, you got a second chance. Yeah. You know, you need to make the most of it. You know, you need to take this gift you were given and like pay it forward, man. Try yeah. and help make other people better. Yeah. And so that's what I've tried to do um as much as possible and yeah do you think that there's a uh i've asked a couple of people this question do you think mindset's something that you can teach somebody do you think it's something like the way that you going through seal training you know and, and reading you know I'm, like i said i'm like five hours into the audiobook the trident and part of the thing you were talking about is like you know you were a smaller kid you weren't you know big and physical and this and that but to go to show up to buds and get through it and do it Was that a mindset that you think you learned over time? Was it something that you, you know, your dad instilled it in you? Was it something that, I mean, how did you think you got, how do you think you got to that point where it's like, you can overcome anything. You're not going to quit no matter what. I, you know, I think some of it is you have it within you, but I absolutely believe it can be developed. So can I take someone who has, you know, (laughs) they quit, you know, when the slightest wind blows, can I take them and get them through seal training? Uh, Maybe. But I tell you what, I can take them and make them 10 times better and 10 times more resilient and 10 times um, 
stronger. Yeah. You know, and that's the thing. That's where I unequivocally believe you can you can build it within yourself. And how do you build it? Well, you build it no differently than um, you 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 physically train your body. And I believe physically training your body is a component of building your mind. If you push yourself outside your comfort zone, those are the things that make you more resilient and stronger. The longer you spend in areas that you're like, I don't like this, and you deal with it is what makes you more resilient. So whether it's um, dealing with a bad situation where emotionally you're projecting positivity, even though everything in you is like, this sucks and I don't want to be positive. You know, I want to tell everybody around me to fuck off. Instead, you swallow that and you're like, okay, all right, guys, we got this. You know, we can do this. I know this sucks right now, but we got this. You know, you, so, I mean, that, every time you do things like that, I think it raises your resiliency and the overcome mindset. Love it. Um, and, but you just have to do it. And, yeah. and it, it drives me insane. I'm not sure why we're going down this road as a nation where we're suddenly making it like quitting is the cool thing to do. You know, if you don't like it, then quit. If you're not um, happy with the situation, quit. You don't like your spouse, quit. Right. I'm, what the hell? What happened to the, this country was built on grit. Yeah, for I mean, sure. It is the foundation of this country. And suddenly, like, I don't know, I, sometime within my lifetime, this is changing. So, uh, you know, parents, if you're listening to this, do not let your kids quit. Yeah. Period. You are doing the greatest disservice to them that you ever kid, that you ever could. My kids know. Um, my kids know. <laughs> my daughter was going through dance last year, and she was really struggling. She had stepped into this higher level, and she was like the most junior who didn't know how to do it, and and she wanted to quit, and uh, and she, she went to my wife and was like. I want to quit this. And then my wife said, have you talked to dad? And she said, no, cause he won't let me. <laughs> <laughs> At least she knows. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and you know what you have to, you know, so, and she did come talk to me and, uh, and I didn't say, no, you, you're just not going to do it. You're not going to quit like that. Although you're I probably I, thinking, yeah. Uh, yeah, but absolutely. But you have to work with people where they are. And I just said, here's the deal. And no different than anything else in life, how we push ourselves a little further, you know, we make micro goals. You know, one of the things, and you know, that's a lesson I learned in Buds and Ranger School. Hey, if all you do every day is look at graduation, you will never make it. Because I tell you what, sometimes just getting through the evolution you're in in that moment, just getting to the end of that is is everything in you mentally you have the ability to do. Right. And and so sometimes these micro goals enable you to in, endure discomfort and pain long enough to relieve the pressure, take a breath, and you're like, oh, you know what? Okay, I think I can go a little further. And that's what I told her. I said, listen, you, you're going to finish this because you signed up for it, and that's all there is to it. Now, if you don't want to do it again next year, we can relook at that. Yeah. But for right now, you're going to finish. And, you know, she finished and she got through it. And now, you know, she's continuing to go on and do it. That's awesome. And that's what kids need because yeah. that's what everybody needs. You know, yeah. I mean, I life is hard. It is going to, um, it is not going to go according to plan. For you sure. Know, you're going to have setbacks. And, you know, the difference between people who are successful and who are not are the ones who continue grinding forward. Yep. It's like I told Phoenix with this, uh, this podcast that I'm doing, it's like the reason I know it's going to be successful is because I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to keep going and keep going and keep going. Don't know where it's going to take me, but I'm not worried about that right now. I'm worried about one podcast at a time. I'm going to yeah. keep going and I keep going. I'm not quitting. You know, and I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm learning things along the way. And I think the mindset piece for me, like what you were just talking about, I just, there was a takeaway right there. Cause I was thinking about it. Like when people were asking me, how did you do a back surgery with no pain pills? How did you quit all your pain pills? Cold Turkey. I didn't have an answer for them. I was like, well, I just did it. And then I just made up my mind and that was it. Um, and I was like, how do I find a way to teach people that though, to have that resiliency to just be like, you make a decision, you run with it and you're done. And you said like increment, incremental change, you know, where it's like do little things day by day that are out of your comfort zone that suck. For me, it's like dumb stuff like taking cold showers. You know, it's like I get up out of bed, 
I do not want to get in a cold shower. It's the last thing I want to do in the wintertime. You know, is getting a cold shower, but it's what I do. Not because it's great. It's because it's something that kind of sucks and just trains my mind a little bit, you know? Yeah. And um, it's not, some people might think that's silly or that's crazy, but for me, it gives me that little extra push, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I dig it. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple questions that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast. Um, the first one being, if you had one person or one book that inspires you the most in your life, what would that be or who would that person be and why? You know, interestingly, um, so I just finished. Um, so I, I'm going to have to tell you too. I'm going to be greedy and tell no. you too. So one totally. would be Adam Brown's book, uh, Fearless, or the book about Adam Brown. Now, Adam was a teammate and I had known Adam my whole career. I sat on Adam's Trident board. And if those of you out there that have never read his story, it's absolutely amazing. Um, you talk about a story of an overcome mindset, but Adam, um, he struggled with addiction problems before he came in the military. And then that bled over into his military career wow. and he managed to hide it from only, but from everybody except for a, a couple of very, very trusted friends. And, uh, and he had all these major accidents occur to him over his career. Um, and he still drove through it, making his way all the way to our highest tier team. And, uh, just reading his story and the journey he went through and the, and the love and the backing of his wife and, you know, his, I mean, I was just dumbfounded by that story. I motivated and had such a greater appreciation for who he was and, and this higher level of an overcome mindset. Um, what was know, that book called again? Fearless. I'm definitely gonna be checking that out. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Sure. And then the, the next book that just recently I finished is Bedros Koulian's book, who you're going to have on, and it's called Man Up. And um, for, for I think it's an amazing book, period. But if you've ever run a business, um, you will have such a higher appreciation for this book. And I really like it because Bedros was not afraid uh, to – to admit a lot of the mistakes he made and then where he messed up. And, um, you know, so I get out of the military and I'm running my nonprofit and I made a lot of mistakes. I mean, we, we got involved in a bad project that, you know, collapsed into a lawsuit. Right. Um, I have learned, you know, once again, you know, easy way, hard way and the Jay Redmond way, you know, <laughs> I learned, you know, the business side of the world through right. the Jay Redmond way. And, um, you know, we recently phased down our organization to try and shift focus over to um, uh, building more content on my side. And I really want to look at where I can lend support to brain health in our veterans and suicide prevention, since we're seeing such an ex escalation in that. Yeah. But when I read Bedros's book recently, man, I just, it was like a punch in the face on the business side. Like, oh man, I could have done that better. Or I could have done this better. Oh man, why didn't I do that? Okay. Um, so for me, that will be the new go-to book I will give anybody I talk to who, you know, is looking for help in life and coaching because it, it literally, he had this life ambush moment where his business was imploding around him. And, um, he thought he was having a heart attack. Yeah. He thought he was having a heart attack. And when he kind of got to the other side, he did an assessment of himself. So kind of like for, for me, it was ranger school for Bedros. It was that situation. And he kind of took a step back at the train wreck of his business and where he was. And he was like me, I'm the problem, yeah. you know, and I'm the solution. And he laid out this solution and the whole book follows this format. He talks about, you know, Hey, uh, so here was my problem. Here's the solution. Here's how you can implement it in your life. And he, he just, he does a phenomenal job of it. So, um, you know, that book right now, if you are looking to be a better leader of yourself, if you are in business, you're looking to be a better leader of a team. I know you're looking at entrepreneurship, read this book. Yeah, for sure. I'll definitely be checking that out. No doubt. I have, and I have a ton of respect for people that are willing to own their, their failures, you know, and use that as a, as a tool and as a method to teach other people like, Hey, listen, this is uh, some of the failures that I had and this is what I learned along the way and impart that knowledge on other people. So it kind of goes in my next question. Um, 
if you had one regret in your life, your biggest biggest regret, what would that regret be and why? And uh, the reason I ask that is it's a learning tool um, because I go back and I listen to all these podcasts, right? And every single person I ask that question to, sometimes, you know, if it's in the military community, the, the regrets are usually pretty similar to, to, and it revolves around family and stuff like this. Um, and other times it's just, it's a great takeaway to be like, okay, if I ever get to that fork in the road and I have a, an opportunity to make this decision or that, which way am I going to go, you know, and kind of learn from other people's mistakes, you know? So if you had a uh, one regret, what would it be and, and why? That's a great question. Um, yeah. another way of looking at it, I guess, is like, if you had a, you know, whether it be your kids or somebody else coming up through the teams, uh, going in the position of leadership, you wish somebody would have taught you or told you, said, hey, man, do it this way instead of that way, instead of doing the Jay Redmond way. <laughs> you know what I, mean? Like, I mean, I have tons of regrets. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I, I flash back on all these different the bad decisions that I've made. Um, I, I'll be honest. I think maybe right now the biggest regret I have is unrealistic expectations of the world and myself. Um, one of the things with the phase down of my organization that I started to realize is I think coming out of a special, and, and maybe there was a little bit of ego that started to creep up within me is, um, in the civilian world now is this mindset that I can do it all. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, there was a great UPS commercial a few years ago where, you know, the guy's like answering the phone and he's like, I can do that. 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 Right. And he like hangs up and he's like, how do I do that? <laughs> and, uh, like for the last five years, as I got out of the military, I was living my life that way. Right. Um, and I literally, I would tell people, often people would be like, Oh my God, how are you doing everything you're doing? You know, do you ever sleep? And I'm like, yeah, you know, a little bit. Um, but I would tell people, I'm like, I don't know, man, I feel like the clown in the circus that's out there spinning plates. And like, all I do is run from, I like, Oh, those plates are getting ready to fall or those plates are getting ready to fall. Let me run over and get yeah, fireman yeah, putting get. out fires. And, uh, and last year I began to realize this is a terrible way to live your life. You're, t you're teaching people about balance and you're teaching people about leading yourself and you're doing a shitty job, man. Yeah. I, I, I was still taking care of my family, but on the business side, I was trying to do everything. And what I started to realize is I was burning bridges, not intentionally, but it would just take me so long to get back to people because, you know, when I got back to them was when their plate started to spin and fall off. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I got to get back to that person. And I realized, man, you're damaging relationships and you're you're just, dude, this is not the way to live. Yeah. Um, so that's probably my biggest regret right now that um, I think I probably let people down over the last five years. And don't get me wrong. I've, I've helped a bunch of people and I'm thankful for that. But I know that it was this idea that I can do everything right. and you can't. There's yep. 24 hours in a day and you got to prioritize what is your focus? Where can you have the biggest impact? And it was the end of last year that I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to make this focus where I can take some of this content that I'm delivering and hopefully make the biggest impact with people and, and take care of my team. Uh, you know, my home team here as best as I possibly can. Yeah, that's huge. I think that that balance is like, it's, it's what you need man. because somewhere along the line, someone's going to suffer. You know what I mean? Whether if you're putting too much, you know, in the work side, your family suffers and, and vice versa, if you do the other way. And so it's like, you got to find that balance, you know, and find things that uh, the other thing that I'm trying to do is find things that I know I'm good at. Okay. So I'll stick to those things and things I'm not very good at that are people are better than me okay, maybe I can outsource that, you know, that you can, you can take care of this for me. So I don't have to do everything, you know, and, and, and to say no a lot, oh, yeah. you know, that's like, yeah. you know, funny people are like, Oh, you know, what's your goal in 2019 to say no. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> for sure. For sure. What's the best way uh, for people to connect with you? Uh, they can find me. My website's probably the best Jason com, Cause yeah. from there you can find all my social media. I mean, if you're looking for it, uh, Jason Redman, WW is Twitter, Instagram. Uh, my public Facebook page is Jason Redman. Um, you know, Ray Care and I are running the JR Overcome show, which is doing really well. We've been blessed to have some great guests on. And you can find that on iTunes podcasts and Google Play. 
nice. um look up jr overcome show and uh yeah we're out there um working on my second book that'll come out the uh the end of the year we're still kind of deciding on the title but it's all about how to survive and thrive from life ambushes so awesome, how man. to um build that overcome mindset to be ready uh, one, how to get out of an ambush if you're already in it and, and a little bit to assess. Some people don't even realize it. You know, they're, they're literally sitting on the X. I mean, I've, I've met some people in coaching that I'm like, holy cow, man. Like, not only are you on the X, you've like, you've like stapled yourself to the X. Right. And, and, you know, it's that victim mentality or they don't sure. even realize it. Yep. So the book is about how to assess yourself, how to realize, you know, we make a lot of parallels between, um, military ambush. And then we look at business personal and these different things. Mm -hmm. So the mechanics of how to get out of it and then how to prepare yourself through the Pentagon of peak performance so that you are balanced and you do, um, you have the ability to, to be ready for one when it comes to identify the signs to physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually to be ready so that you will survive it and yeah. thrive from it. I love it, man. It's totally awesome. I think it's really cool because there's if guys like you that have gone through actually real world situations that you've overcome. And like you said, credibility is everything, you know what I mean? And like, that's, that's part of leadership. And when you have that credibility, it's like, yeah, people are willing to listen. They want to listen. They, they eat it up, you know? Cause I think a lot of, like you said, people get stuck on that X. I was telling, you know, Phoenix on the way here that sometimes people find themselves in chaos because they're so comfortable with that chaos. Cause it's been their whole life that when things are too calm and things are going good, you almost like self sabotage shit because it's like, dude, I'm just so comfortable in the, being on the X that when things get too easy for me, I'm going to, I'm going to totally jack it up, you know, so I can get back in that, that chaos mode. Yeah. Um, and so I guess being self-aware is kind of the learn on that is like being self-aware enough to know that, Hey man, I'm kind of causing this shit right now and I need to maybe, uh, readjust here yep. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Life can be a little more enjoyable, man. Oh, for sure. <laughs> you know, I, I really appreciate you coming on, Jay. And um, if there's anything I can ever do for you, man, I, you know, don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. I, I genuinely appreciate your willingness to come on and share your story. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to reading your next book and finishing the book that uh, that I'm reading now, The Trident. So if you guys haven't read The Trident, I highly recommend that you get that book. It's uh, It like moves me to tears and gets me kind of like all emotional, you know, and, and gives me the chills when I hear these stories. And now that I'm meeting you in person, it, it becomes like more real to me. Um, so again, man, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Josh, thanks, man. No, I'm honored. So uh, yeah, hey, get out there, everybody. Build that mindset, man. That's all right, brother. Cool. Thanks, man. All right. Later. Out. Thank you for listening to My Backstory. Stay motivated and stay connected off the show. Follow at my underscore backstory underscore to be a part of the journey to recovery and to see where your story goes. Or visit us online at hereismybackstory.com.